seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go! Seven, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go! Right, so welcome to the July uh, 2022 meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society and um, quite uh, an interesting month uh, it has been. Um, what uh, we're seeing here is the first launch from uh, Arnhem Land of the first of the sounding rockets, the uh, Black Brant uh, 9 by uh, NASA and uh, chosen actually up there. You, you can see uh, over at the top right hand side the location in Australia. So. Um, uh, right up the top there by Darwin on the left and on the, the top right hand side is where the Arnhem uh, Space Centre is at Nullaboy and uh, that's the uh, view from the air there so the controls are over on the right hand side and uh, on the other side is where uh, the rockets actually uh, fire off. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, the rocket is uh, about 12 metres high although various media reported it as 12, 13 or 14 metres high. Um, for all practical purposes, that's about four storeys high, so it's a significant sounding rocket. Um, it's able to launch a payload up to well over 500 kilometres high, so in other words, it can go higher than the International Space Station if it had to. Uh, these ones are only launched up um, around the 300 to 400 kilometre height in between that, so not quite as high as the International uh, Space Station. And chosen there because it's very close to Earth's equator, so you're getting some centrifugal force um, assisting the launch uh, by the spin of the Earth at that point. Uh, what you're seeing here is all three of them were looking at uh, Alpha Centauri, which is the brightest star of the two pointer stars. Uh, Alpha Centauri is actually a triple system with um, A, B, and C components. What you see here is a Hubble Space Image, uh, Space Telescope image of the A and B components stars of Alpha Centauri, and the C component star is also called Proxima Centauri, which most people know it as, but uh, well and truly out of the field of view of uh, Hubble in that particular case. Now, after they launch uh, these rockets, they then have to go and retrieve the bits and pieces and uh, they then uh, send the local rangers out to find it and shown picture here is uh, the local rangers uh, the next day when they bring back when they brought back some of the pieces at the time of that photo i think they were still missing one piece that they haven't hadn't tracked down yet so i'm not sure if they found every single piece uh, yet uh, at all but they had to contend with snakes and wild buffaloes and that so not to, not for the faint hearted uh, to uh, retrieve it uh, down the bottom here, uh, aside from the rocket launches, was uh, the James Webb Telescope. So the first um, first images uh, that were uh, returned were the ones that uh, were announced by the President of the United States on the TV. And uh, what uh, our member Russell Smith did is uh, create a blink comparison showing the difference between Hubble and um, the James Webb Telescope images. The Hubble images are the ones that look sort of an orangey-red colour and the whiter looking ones on, on this uh, picture here is the, uh, on the ones on James Webb. Uh, another way you find it, uh, another way to tell is actually look at how many of the um, uh, diffraction spikes appear. So the James Webb has uh, at least six diffraction spikes, whereas Hubble only has four. So that way, that's an easy way of actually telling it. So you can actually see a lot more detail uh, if uh, you're going into focus there. So a great, great effort of him to actually pull together that blink comparison very, very quickly. And uh, still on the uh, James Webb Telescope, uh, in the last uh, couple of days, uh, there were these images taken of uh, Jupiter by it. Uh, of course, this is in the infrared with various infrared uh, filters. Over here on the left hand side, you obviously see Jupiter, the great red spot appears red. Uh, you've got the moon Europa over here and its shadow uh, cast onto the surface of uh, Jupiter. Uh, you'll notice it looks a bit like a solar eclipse because it's a very similar phenomenon. They have what's called a coronagraph in there where they actually insert a little object at uh, just the right point um, in uh, the optical train to uh, mask uh, anything bright behind it. And that's what they've done here to try and hide the light from um, Europa. 
and um, uh, the telescope actually has four of these coronagraphs uh, that uh, they're able to actually do that. One is an active one, I think, where they physically move a disc into place to block the light, and the other three coronagraphs are uh, a, a different type that uh, tries to put light out of phase and uh, so cause uh, the same sort of effect, but um, without actually having to move things around. So uh, really, really clever idea. I think it was only invented about uh, a decade ago. On uh, the right hand side here we see in uh, other wavelengths, again we see Europa and, uh, and Jupiter there. Uh, a few artifacts actually on this one. Um, and uh, what you see also here as well is, I'm not entirely sure what that is, so whether or not that's where the uh, meteorite that we, um, the meteoroid uh, had gone into it, or whether it's just an imaging artifact or a processing artifact. Uh, they, uh, I, I looked very, very carefully online to try and find anyone explaining what that was, and it was deathly quiet. And everyone just had uh, promulgated the media releases in all, all the different uh, outlets. They didn't apply a flat frame to the image paper. <laughs> and even down here, where you've got to Europa, notice you've got like a secondary image there. It's almost as if you're getting like uh, an internal reflection uh, going on there uh, in, uh, in the middle. Now you'll notice the diffraction spikes here. Well, there's um, six, uh, six sets of them, and I'll explain a bit more about those uh, next uh, meeting instead. Uh, the actual uh, infrared detector is here, a 16 mega, a megapixel uh, detector. And um, they also tested uh, the James Webb Telescope in following a uh, minor planet, an asteroid called uh, Tenzing. Uh, I think that's probably named after Sherp Tenzing of uh, um, Mount Everest uh, fame with Edmund uh, Hillary. And uh, what they did there was uh, they, um, they were able to actually track it in the presence of a really bright background star. And as you see, they've got the coronagraph on the front of it blocking out most of the light. And why that's important is because they're going to be searching for planets around other stars where um, the brightness difference between the star and its um, orbiting planets is so huge that you have to try and block out um, as much as you possibly can to be able to uh, detect it. So what, um, what we'll do uh, tonight is I'll first of all go through uh, the, uh, the events of the past and coming months, so I usually do, then uh, we'll go into looking at um, Fred Tucker's online uh, explanations about uh, the first images, so those set of uh, four or five images that uh, came out, and uh, he'll go into uh, some of the science behind it as well. Uh, then we'll look at the, uh, each of the three Arnhem Space Centre launches in turn, that will probably go for about uh, five or six minutes as well, looking at some of the behind the scenes footage that um, Brad Tucker took at the time. Uh, then the main talk is going to be uh, on uh, rocket science and this is how uh, rockets work and how they uh, propel so uh, you may learn a bit there as well and that uh, tends to uh, strain a bit of chemistry as well. Then uh, sky for the month, I assume Mark uh, has uh, got that. Um, then we'll break for tea break somewhere in there and uh, if, you, if you feel thirsty at any time do quietly get up and uh, go outside and uh, help yourself. Uh, no need to uh, sit in here uh, unnecessarily. Then uh, why do rockets actually roll? So in other words, when you see a launch, have you ever noticed how they tend to uh, turn, turn around uh, for some reason? And this explains why that is uh, necessary. And then we look at why two shadows uh, tend to merge when they're close together. If you've ever uh, tried putting two shadows together, have you ever noticed how they, they seem to have like a, uh, um, a, a, a dark adjoining between them uh, where rather than uh, uh, just stay as two separate circles? And then we'll close at the end with a bit of a fun close um, that uh, takes you on a bit of a journey through uh, the entire universe right back to the uh, Big Bang and so, so forth. And for anyone that's seen Walt Disney's um, uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, this bit will uh, come to mind of that. Now, recent events, very, very quickly. We've, uh, in the last month, we've only done one school, which was uh, actually here at the Briars, which is uh, the school that uh, Simon is at. Uh, in uh, Narrow Warren, and unfortunately they were almost entirely clouded out uh, for the evening, uh, as luck would have uh, I uh, gave the talk in here, and um, then we had a uh, public night where Guido gave the talk, and he was a bit, uh, bit more fortunate with uh, the clouds, so they were able to at least see something outside, which was uh, really, really good. Coming up, things are starting to uh, hot up over the next uh, 
month to two months. We have lots of requests uh, coming in from all over the place. Um, this uh, Saturday we have a members working bee and those on East Corpus will have seen Greg's email today. So we'll be listing out um, each of uh, the, uh, the desired tasks uh, to be done. So that will start at uh, four o'clock. Uh, committee meeting next week, then onto the um, public night where uh, at this stage Catherine is uh, going to be giving the talk. Uh, the room is uh, fully booked uh, for that one, so at least at the cap of 70 that we're keeping there during the uh, pandemic. Then uh, a few days later we've got um, the uh, South Frankston Cubs going to be coming here to the Briars uh, for a talk. And uh, one of their cup leaders is uh, the one who um, put together the sites in the park at uh, Coolart. So it's uh, one of her children uh, in that uh, particular pack. Uh, a couple of days later, we're out at uh, Frankston at uh, Mount Erin uh, Secondary College. And um, unfortunately, with them, we had to cancel last year because of uh, all uh, the lockdowns and, uh, and restrictions. So uh, they've tried a couple of years to actually catch us and have just managed to pick exactly the wrong date on both of the years, unfortunately. Then we have uh, the monthly, uh, sorry, the quarterly uh, Scouts, Cups and Guys night, the SCAG night as we uh, refer it to, and we've got uh, quite a few packs uh, there. In fact, we may even be getting up close to uh, the 70 mark, I would say, by that uh, time. So it will be very different to the previous SCAG nights that we've had this year. We're, we're anticipating to have um, probably uh, all 70 on that one, and we're still looking for a speaker for that one. Um, then uh, Eden White is uh, starting up a bit of a cosmology discussion group here in the Briars on a Saturday and uh, his first one is going to be on the uh, 13th of August at 2 o'clock. He's put out the invitation on uh, emails on East Scorpius to anyone who's interested in that and quite a few people have put up their hands. Um, then National Science Week starts on that particular day as well and uh, with all the events online and as it turns out our public night and our scout nights are the very first entry nationally that's shown whenever anyone goes to look at the event so we're getting lots of very high visibility uh, publicity for uh, quite a few months uh, whenever anyone goes to that site and no matter where they are in Australia they look up where their local events are and up pops impasse. Um, then uh, our next meeting is here on uh, the 17th of August. So I'll begin with uh, Brad uh, Tucker's one on uh, the images from uh, the telescope and uh, this one will uh, go for I think probably about uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. Hey, it's Dr. Brad with the very first images from the James Webb Space Telescope, something I've been waiting for so long. And as part of this first batch, we saw five images. The first one that was released, which was of a cluster of galaxies, uh, actually released by President Biden himself. We also had the beautiful Carina Nebula, sometimes called the Cliffs of the Nebula, which is this beautiful landscape, almost like a painting. We had another nebula, the Southern Ring Nebula, which is actually a planetary nebula. We also had Stevens Quintet, a group of five galaxies kind of all interacting together and the first measurement of the atmosphere of another exoplanet from the James Webb Space Telescope. So those who don't know about this telescope, this was built as the, the successor to Hubble, not the replacement. James Webb Space Telescope has a mirror that's six and a half meters wide. To put that into scale, Hubble's is only 2.4 meters wide. And with the telescope, the bigger the telescope, the more light you can see, it's a giant light bucket. But the James Webb can also see in the infrared color, something that Hubble couldn't see. So these are the colors of light beyond the visible that you can't see with their eyes. And this thing has been decades in the making with thousands of engineers and scientists coming together to do it. It was launched back on Christmas and for the past six months has been slowly getting ready. And that was because this is so big and it'd be folded into the rocket, launched into space, and then unfolded like a piece of origami. So it's been so challenging to get it to ready and ready for this momentous day. And this day was so momentous, it's very rare that you actually get the president himself, President Biden, wanting to release the first image. In fact, you could almost say, you know, some people are wondering, was he going to announce aliens? But no, he saw and released the first image from this powerful space telescope. Now, the first image release was of a cluster of galaxies called S Max 0723. Doesn't have the best name, but it is a gorgeous photo with so many things happening. Now, all of these images have actually been imaged by Hubble previously. 
And in fact, you know, when we looked at the Hubble image, it was so scientifically amazing. But now that we see this James Webb Space Telescope, there is so much going on, so much more detail we can see. Now, obviously, we're drawn to seeing these really bright stars kind of in the center and off to the bottom right. In fact, these stars are so bright, we notice that there's these six lines coming across it. These are what we call diffraction spikes. The light is actually bouncing off the struts of the secondary telescope mirror, the thing that holds it together, bouncing off into the camera. It is that bright. But what is the real star of this is this galaxy and cluster of galaxies in the center. Now this galaxy is a few billion light years away, but there is so much mass here, it's acting with its gravity as a giant magnifying lens. It's doing something we call gravitational lensing. And as we look around the image, we see these curved bits. And these curved kind of stretchy galaxies are actually galaxies behind that cluster. They're behind that cluster about 13 billion light years away. So they're towards the beginning of the universe, but through gravity, it's being magnified around and picked up by the James Webb Space Telescope. This image literally has thousands of thousands of galaxies. Essentially, every dot in this image is an entire galaxy. An entire galaxy with tens to hundreds of billions of stars. Stars that probably have planets around it. Planets that probably have moons. There is so much stuff in the universe, yet it is just a smudge on the cosmic scale in terms of what's being looked at. And of course, when you look at this image, you're drawn to the idea if there's so many stars and planets and stuff out there, is there life? That is going to be one of the big things that James Webb starts to hopefully shine on, and that is just how big the universe is, and maybe are we alone? And speaking of are we alone, one of the first bits of real scientific data that's super exciting is of the atmosphere of another planet around another star called an exoplanet. Uh, and so this planet has the name WASP-96b, and it's what we call a hot Jupiter. So uh, it's a bit less massive and a bit wider than Jupiter, but still Jupiter size. But it orbits its star so close that one year only lasts about three and a half days. So literally, it goes around its star every three and a half days. And so by being so close, it's hot. And so James Webb took a measurement of the atmosphere of this hot Jupiter and it found heaps of water vapor. Now, it's obviously too hot to have liquid water, which means this water vapor is contained in the atmosphere. And it's actually probably almost more like steam. It's, it could be almost a, a giant steam bath planet. They even detected some haze and clouds by the moving bits and moving clumps of this water vapor. And this is going to be a huge part of what James Webb does, looking at all of these thousands, hundreds and thousands of planets around other stars to measure what does they have in the atmosphere? Is it oxygen? Is it water? And potentially even look for signs of life directly. And this really highlights one of the big ways James Webb's going to be used, and that is through what we call spectroscopy or kind of uh, astronomical rainbows. You break up the colors of light into very specific colors, so specific they result or match up to certain elements or gases or molecules in the universe. And in this case, they found that it matched up to the H2O molecule, i.e. water or ice. And now this is going to be one of the huge ways that James Webb unveils the universe is by measuring the elements of not just planets, but stars, galaxies, and everything across the universe. And the third image, and clearly probably my favorite given it's my background, is the Carina Nebula. And this beautiful image obviously is gorgeous, but has a lot of scientific things going on it. This is essentially a gas cloud that has come from some sort of old star. And over time, this gas is being condensed down, squeezed through gravity into balls to actually form new stars. It's what we call a stellar nursery. And when you look at this image, when you see all these little bumps and wiggles, these bumps and wiggles are gravity pulling new stars, quite literally coming together in somewhat real time to form the birth of a new star system. And with the power of the James Webb Space Telescope, we've been able to see subtle detail that we missed before, little wiggles and nodules that were previously missed by the Hubble Space Telescope. And because the James Webb Space Telescope can see in the infrared, it can see different things than Hubble can. So think about night vision or, or police-seeking vision or, or, or heat-seeking vision. Infrared light can actually see through things that the visible light can't. And in this case, it can see through the, the dust and the building blocks of planets. 
And so by using the infrared light, we quite literally saw new stars that were previously hidden to Hubble. Also released was this beautiful image of the Southern Ring Nebula. And this is what we call a planetary nebula. So when a star like our sun grows, it will turn into a red giant and then puff out all of its layers into space, kind of like a big burp or a cocoon. And this creates these very beautiful images. And at the center is left with what we call a white dwarf, something our sun will be in billions of years. Now, when previously this image was looked at, we saw the star in the center, but it was always hypothesized there was actually a second star right nearby that was actually doing the action. And that was because when we measured the property of the star, it didn't quite match up. And again, with the power of the James Webb Space Telescope by being able to see clear and different light, the second star has been spotted, kind of the culprit actually of this planetary nebula. And now we realize that the star that was kind of the blame one in the past will go down the path of also turning into a planetary nebula, creating an even cooler image way into the future. And last but not least is Stevens Quintet, this beautiful arrangement of five galaxies. We have the one on the top, you have the one on the left, on the bottom, and kind of these two at the center. And these galaxies are what we're doing calling a collision. That is, the galaxies are actually coming together and colliding. And when galaxies do, through the massive amount of gravity, gas and stars get shot around and blown out. And through the power of the James Webb Space Telescope and looking in the infrared, we can see the shock wave, this bow coming off of this collision at the center where this red bit is. Now, as this gas is plowed into space, it will condense down and actually likely form new stars. So this is a very active area of space and one that actually happens quite a lot, and that is galaxies coming together to form new galaxies. And James Webb has been catching it in the action. Now, a ton of people on Facebook and social media have been asking me, are the colors real? Uh, we can't see infrared, so what's going on here? Now, the answer is kinda. The data and the colors are real, but they may not actually be that true color. So when we take data through any telescope, we break it up into colors of light. We'll measure the blue or green, yellow or red, or infrared. And when we look at the individual colors of light, we just actually look at it in grayscale. It's not as interesting as it may seem, because that's because we're measuring the brightness and intensity in that color. And then when we put the images together, we'll say, okay, well, blue is blue and green is green, red's red, yellow's yellow. But now we have this infrared color, and the infrared color is a real color, but clearly our eyes can't see it. So we kind of bring down the infrared color into this orangey red color. So the Stevens Quintet image is a beautiful example. Essentially, all of the colors here are real, except when you see that orangey red bit. This is the infrared color that has been signed and brought down to just at the edge of the red light where we can see it with our eyes. Otherwise, we wouldn't see it. And so it's really there and it's really going on. But if we were to look at it, we would be completely invisible to it. But it doesn't mean it's not happening. There's other types of light that we can kind of relate this to. Think of ultraviolet light, right? We know that if in the summer we don't put on sunscreen, we'll get burnt. There is light coming down from the sun, hitting the earth, but we can't see it. But clearly our body does. X-rays, if you've ever gone to the hospital and had an X-ray of your bones, clearly it can see things. You can't, but it's actually measuring it. So it's all real light. It's just different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, as we say. And I think it's obvious my favorite image is the Crinian Nebula, but I really love the exoplanet science results. This is such a big question. Are there other, other habitable planets? Are we alone? James Webb is going to try and answer this. And the technique it uses is one that I will use for looking at galaxies and supernova, and so many people in the astronomical community as well. Now, this is the first of the uh, three launches, and uh, uh, Brad uh, is actually um, uh, hosting this one uh, online at the time. This is the X-ray quantum uh, calorimeter one. Five, four, three, two, one, go! We are here at the Arnhem Space Center in Nolamboy, Yolnu country. And we are about to embark on a journey of launching a rocket. So poetic, so hard to do, 
and yet so simple in some ways. And when we enjoy the beautiful landscape, it's this beautiful kind of red dirt. And we're going to be seeing a lot of this. And I'll probably be seeing a lot of this on every inch uh, that I have. Here at the Arnhem Space Center, just beginning to see what's going on. It's a busy place happening. There's cars, there's action, there's testing. There's all sorts of things all happening here. So down there is the range. That little shed is the rocket. So you're seeing how it looks like during the test. They actually have it covered up before launch. This is the essentially the NASA weather wind tower. And so there's this little monitoring station on the top of it, monitoring and making sure that uh, essentially the winds are at the right level for the launch. Uh, this will become a very important thing to monitor, to measure and check. It's kind of kind of cool that you see these little portable bollards uh, having to be done, obviously for safety reasons. You know, this is essentially a site that's been done on the fly. We're in the launch control center, getting ready for the dress rehearsal, which is gonna take about eight hours to complete, a full simulation of the launch. So right now we're kind of in the middle of a pause. We've been having pa pauses in this dress rehearsal. The dress rehearsal uh, is essentially a test countdown. So we make sure everything's working, everything's going, everyone knows what they're doing. Uh, now there are some small problems, nothing really major. So one of the things that's been happening on and off here is a bit of rain. Uh, in fact, we've been having a number of quick, sharp downpours, which has caused a bunch of pausing uh, in the dress rehearsal. Now, for those who know, this is supposed to be the dry season where it's actually not wet. And locals will say this isn't wet, but it's still enough rain to put a damper on things just for a few seconds at a time. Hanging outside the launch control center, now in a few minutes, we're all going to go down the road to see the rocket. It's going to be my first time seeing this up close and I'm going to be excited. Now where I'm at at the operational control center is about 400 meters from the rocket. Now a lot of the roads on the site have been made for this launch and for this facility and the nearby roads have recently been regraded. Uh, and it's actually everyone saying how much of a treat it is for the smooth roads around here. So here I am at the rocket, it's about 12 meters tall. Uh, to say I'm excited is a little bit of an understatement. I took as many photos. I was the classic tourist, but in front of a rocket right now. So this is where the rocket is stored. It's rolled out on the rails, as you can see, uh, and then it goes into position. Um, there's actually a lot of the cooling and electronics underneath. In fact, the pier is about 14 meters deep. This is where I've been working out of the uh, mission control office. This is the site that has been my mobile TV studio. In fact, if we quickly look, uh, we can see some marks where I've actually marked into the ground a H for here. That's been my standing spot. Uh, have objects are looking at that's only visible from the southern hemisphere, so you can't see it from the U.S. the north. Uh, the second and third missions will be looking at something called Alpha Centauri. So if you look towards the Southern Cross, Alpha Centauri is the it's actually been a great place to stay because we're five minutes away. Um, and the process, uh, so sometimes during that countdown, you have to make sure things are double checked. Again, safety and success is. I don't even want to hear myself talk anymore. <laughs> There's only so, there, it really is comical watching all the comments on every time, you know, you say T1 is free take it, doesn't drink at this point. Everyone's having fun with it, please. Now, <laughs> it's sounding very heavy in here. Now, people may have noticed I'm a tad excited by this. Now, uh, I am a scientist. Uh, my specialty is looking at stars that explode and how uh, the universe evolves. Hey, the rain's stopping. There you go. That's the great thing about the weather. So the winds have just popped up again, unfortunately. So we're holding now at 58 seconds. We will see if we resume this countdown. You know this wind. I am going to be happy if I never hear of wind again. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'll say that once the winds are deemed um, too high, we have to reset the three minute clock.
minutes. Luckily, we're not going past three minutes at this point. So the official count, we're just being informed. We did get to officially eight seconds, but we had to restart to three minutes. And again, this is all just the... So we're just doing... Copy that, confirming balloon test. Thank you. So we're just, so NASA has decided, so what they're doing is a balloon test. So now the idea here is they actually want to just make sure they test uh, that higher level wind. And you know what? We're back on count. Yes. So we are now T minus 140 and counting. So we did it, the first commercial launch from Australia. Uh, and the next day, the helicopter went out and retrieved the scientific payload about 5.30 p.m. Look, I may look a little bit disheveled, but last night, we finished about two o'clock. By the time I found a ride into town, uh, we got there about 2.30. I had to wake up by four o'clock to start getting ready for the next round of interviews, next activity, and getting the things on site. Uh, it's been quite a journey for this first launch uh, that has just happened over my shoulder, right over there. And hopefully the second and third launch will go as well. I hope you've enjoyed seeing a little bit how this is put together. That was the first launch. Second launch goes for a couple of minutes. Uh, this one wasn't streamed live, uh, but this is, uh, it was covered by uh, ABC TV. They sent a uh, TV crew out there so you can actually get to see the second one, which was the Sistine mission. Three, two, one. Blast off as NASA's second rocket slices the Northern Territory's sky towards space. Weldon Flash. My eyes were burning. <laughs> she was bright, very bright. Uh, it's a once in a lifetime experience anyway, so it's good to see it be a part of it. The suborbital sounding rocket named Sistine 3 lit up the Arnhem Space Centre and roared off before midnight last night. The launch already faced 48 hours of weather delays and was looking close to being called off for another night when the wind calmed and the NASA team found their window to fire. It's really progressing us as, as civilization goes forward. And so it's, yeah, it's pretty wonderful. I'm very excited about it. The rocket is the second of three the NASA team is launching from the spaceport in northeast Arnhem Land, aiming to uncover the mysteries of a distant star system. So all the things we sort of take for granted that happen here on Earth with our sun, we just don't know those things about planets around other stars. And so that's what we're here to measure. It's NASA's first commercial launch mission outside of the US and scientists hope it's the first of many. NASA plans to come back, uh, you know, we know the Kate is yet and we hope that this really turns into a successful commercial venture. Here in this shed, technicians are putting the finishing touches on this suborbital sounding rocket named JUICE, which is set for takeoff from the Arnhem Space Center on the 12th of July. Until then, NASA is relishing in last night's launch and the opportunity to shoot for the stars. Matt Garrick, ABC News, Nullanboy. Number two and the third and final one was the, uh, the JUICE mission that they showed the rocket uh, there. It's going to be a couple of minutes as well. T minus one minute, 30 seconds and counting now. This will be taking off. It will be launching um, to take the extreme ultraviolet image, uh, imager and spectrograph juice to look at our neighbor star to us, Alpha Centauri. And again, looking at both of them, Alpha Centauri A and B. Oh man, we're almost there. The wind scene ready. I know some people are like, are we gonna get another delay? We went through this. No, as of now, it seems to be cooperating. We seem to be good. Um, the winds are stable, everything is cooperating. T minus a minute now, 55 seconds. We are getting really close. We will be following this as quickly as we can, ready for this rocket to take off. Oh boy, if you saw me excited in the first one, you know I'm gonna be excited for the third one. Who can't be excited by a rocket launch? We're gonna go take a look at the nearest star to us in colors of light that we cannot see um, from the ground. T minus 30 seconds, 
get ready. This rocket is about to take off. We are close. The rocket is close. The rocket is ready. Oh, man. 20 seconds and counting. And we will follow it as quickly as we can. But, you know, uh, this rocket moves in a hurry. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And it's going. You can see the smoke haze left behind on this rocket. We did get on some other shots and we'll bring that to you in a second. As I said, this thing takes off. It is now into space. It is getting there. Um, we're already um, on our way and only 100 seconds after takeoff, um, they're already acquiring data. So the science team is about to kick into action to get ready for it. Oh man, there goes a rocket. Oh yeah, who doesn't love this? This is amazing. We are seeing a third rocket launch from Australia take off. And as I said, I warned you, this thing takes off like it's in a hurry and boy, it did. It took off to get there into space to get ready to look at the extreme ultraviolet part of Alpha Centauri A and B. So each of those rockets goes up in a great big parabola, goes up into space, at the top of the parabola starts taking measurements and then it parachutes back down. So obviously the parachute slows it down considerably and they retrieve uh, the instruments uh, if, if they can find it. I believe NASA has had some uh, instances in the past where they've shot sounding rockets up and um, they've come down in water and not been able to find the instrument afterwards, which would be uh, a little bit unfortunate. Now this is a still I took from that video at uh, T minus three minutes and you'll notice a couple of things, obviously there's the rocket there, but you notice the Southern Cross, oops, Southern Cross there, and you probably just about make out Delta Cruises if you look really, really carefully. There's the two pointers and obviously that one is Alpha Centauri and that's where it was uh, uh, going to point its instruments. So that, that was the target of uh, the, the, those three particular missions. And from that, you can see uh, where south is using uh, the usual uh, methods. So south is in that direction. So up in Arnhem Land, but they were firing it down towards the south. And as you can see, it's pointing there to the right-hand side of it. So they, they fired it off uh, in a southwesterly direction, which is over land at, uh, on that part of uh, Arnhem Land. So in other words, they, when it comes down, they could then find it. But they shot it in a southerly direction, not in a uh, northerly one. Uh, and uh, I was a bit surprised that they didn't actually mention that at any time because uh, uh, Alpha Centauri kept uh, peeking through the clouds. So with that, do we know the science that they're doing with these launches, are we going to be seeing any of the results from that? Uh, well, uh, eventually we will in the sense that they're commercial um, payloads, so the universities have actually bought the, uh, the time on those rockets will eventually publish the results and we'll see them that way. Um, but it was just a commercial venture as far as Australia is concerned. So, um, you know, we, we're providing the facility and they're renting the facility and, uh, and the people that are there to uh, cause the launch to go off and uh, find the payloads afterwards. Two, two things, Peter. Yeah. When, when you see the, the rockets taken off a cannon, Kennedy and so on, they come up very slowly. Yeah. But this one takes something like a bullet. That's because the ones at Cape Kennedy are, are huge in comparison. They're, they're like um, lifting off a small building, whereas these are, um, you know, that, you, you might have seen from the second one that the size of them is about the size of uh, the telescope that Greg made at the back there. Uh, it's sort of in diameter, and, uh, you know, compared to the size of the ones, the big ones that go up, um, the mass that's being, being shot up is so much less. Um, so that, that would be purely why. The second question is, uh, can this be repurposed to defend our northern boundary? <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, well. Yeah. Well, they, they actually um, quote the uh, Defence Forces as, uh, as one of their potential clients for, uh, for it. So <laughs> maybe the answer to that is yes. <laughs> OK, well, the main talk tonight, and as I said, feel free to get up and get a drink at any time and come, come and go as you wish, is uh, this uh, gentleman here, uh, Professor Chris uh, Bishop. He's uh, actually uh, in uh, the field of IT and um, artificial intelligence. And uh, he also knows an awful lot about uh, chemistry and fireworks uh, as well. So uh, he'll, he'll be going through um, uh, the chemistry behind uh, rockets, uh, how they actually uh, uh, work in terms of the fuel and that. And that will go for about uh, 50 odd minutes. So as I say, feel free to get up and, um, and uh, uh, stretch your legs and uh, go and get a drink at any time. Well. Good afternoon, welcome to the Department of Chemistry, welcome to the Cambridge Science Festival, and welcome to this lecture on rocket science. Now, every rocket that has ever flown, whether it's a small firework rocket, or whether it's a giant rocket that's carrying people to the moon, every rocket is based on one simple principle. So I thought I'd begin this lecture by demonstrating that principle. So this is a beautiful reproduction in miniature of a Napoleonic cannon, but it's a working model. And it's actually capable of firing a live round, a uh, half-inch diameter lead cannonball. Uh, today we won't fire a live round, but I'm going to fire a blank round. And when we do, I want you to observe what happens to the cannon. Now, the cannon is really just a tube that's closed at this end and open at this end. This is called the muzzle. And there's a small hole called the touch hole that we use to transmit fire to the main charge. So I'm going to begin by taking a piece of slow-burning fuse and placing that in the touch hole. And then we're going to charge this with gunpowder. So the gunpowder is in this uh, nice powder horn. Uh, the way this works is I put my finger over the brass nozzle. I press the the valve and tip it upside down, and powder trickles into that brass spout. So we're measuring a precise quantity of, of gunpowder. And I release the valve and, and turn it upside uh, right way up again, and we have a measured quantity of gunpowder in the spout. So I'll place that uh, into the barrel of the cannon. And I thought, since this is Science Week, we'll use a, a double dose. <laughs> well, here's a double dose of gunpowder going into the cannon. So that's the gunpowder in the barrel. I'll put this safely out of the way. Now to keep the gunpowder in the barrel and keep it up against the fuse, we're going to use a little bit of wadding. So this is some fireproof wadding, which I'm going to put into the, into the muzzle of the cannon, and then use this ramrod to pack the, the wadding and the gunpowder tight up against the, the fuse. Now, at this point, we would put our cannonball in. We're not going to do that today. So instead, we'll, we'll simulate that by using a bit more wadding. So I'm going to put some more wadding into the barrel. And again, just pack that down. And then finally, to, uh, to stop the ball rolling out, as it were, we'd, we'd use a bit more wadding. So why not? Let's do a bit more wadding. <laughs> it is the science festival, after all. OK, so we've got this wadding nicely packed down. Our cannon uh, will be loaded, and it's now ready to fire. So I'm going to light the fuse. From where I'm standing, it's quite noisy, so I'm going to be covering my ears. If you're near the front, you may wish to do the same. When the fuse burns down and the cannon fires, I want you to look carefully what happens to the cannon. So here we go. Okay, so as you saw, the cannon shot backwards. We call that recoil. Now, this is a very basic principle of physics. It's the idea of conservation of momentum. So when the cannon fired, hot gases and pieces of wadding were shot out of the barrel at great speed in this direction. So those pieces of material had a lot of momentum in this direction, but the total amount of momentum in the world can't change. And so the cannon acquired some momentum in the opposite direction. So this is the basic principle of the rocket. By firing gases very fast in one direction, we create a force in the opposite direction. 
Now, this cannon is very nice, but of course the force was created sort of all at once. We just had an explosion. If we want to build a rocket, what we need is a nice steady push that goes on for a long time. And to see how we can do that, um, Chris in the department here has been building this lovely demonstration. And as you can see, this is a, a go-kart, but it's a rather unusual go-kart because this is powered by a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. <laughs> so the, the fire extinguisher is at the back, and inside the fire extinguisher is carbon dioxide that's been compressed so much that it's turned into a liquid. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the fire extinguisher. When I press on the pedal, it will open the valve and the carbon dioxide will escape with great speed in that direction. And so it should create a force in this direction. So what I'm hoping is that it will push the go-kart forward. So should we give this a try? Are we ready, Chris? Okay, all set? Okay, here we go. Okay, so that's the principle of the rocket. On the go-kart, we had gases escaping very fast in one direction, providing a force in the opposite direction. But we used a whole cylinder of carbon dioxide just to get a few meters. It wasn't very effective. And the reason is that compressed gas doesn't really contain enough energy. We need some way of getting a lot more energy out of every kilogram of propellant. And to do that, we're going to turn to chemistry. Now, you're all familiar with the motor car, and in the motor car, we take uh, a chemical, a fuel, either petrol or diesel, and we react it chemically with the oxygen of the air. We call that combustion. That produces energy, which drives pistons, which turns the wheels on the car and drives the car forward. Could we use that same principle of combustion to produce not a turning of wheels, but rather a rocket-like force? Well, we can, and the next demonstration, if we could bring this on, please, shows exactly that principle. And again, it's one that's very familiar. It's called the jet engine. So in a jet engine, we burn fuel. In this case, uh, it's a fuel called Jet A1. It's a bit like kerosene. And I have some of the fuel in this bottle. It's reacted chemically with the oxygen of the air to produce uh, uh, an escaping jet of gas traveling very fast. And that produces a force in the opposite direction. So we'll uh, just set this up. And when this is running, it will be quite noisy, so I'm going to wear a pair of ear defenders for this. So this is controlled by a little computer, so I'm just going to switch on the computer. And now we're starting the engine. This will take about 20 seconds or so to start, and it'll run up, first of all, to idle power, which is about 40,000 RPM. And then when it's at idle power, I'm going to ramp it up to full power for just two seconds and then switch it off. Why two seconds? Well, at full power, it'll be doing 150,000 RPM. It'll generate 100 newtons of thrust. That's 10 kilograms of thrust. The exhaust gas temperature is 700 degrees, traveling at 1,500 kilometers per hour, consuming a third of a liter per minute of fuel and producing 20 kilowatts of power. So here it is ramping up, it's at 18,000 RPM. Twenty-five thousand RPM. Thirty-five thousand RPM. And it's now at idle power, just over forty thousand RPM. And I'm now gonna take it up to full power for two seconds and then I'll shut it down. You ready? Here we go. <clears throat> so that little jet engine is, is very impressive, but jet engines suffer from one major problem, which is that they require 
air to work. They need the oxygen from the air. And that's okay in the Earth's atmosphere, but it's no good if we want to go to the moon because we have to travel in outer space. There's no air and therefore no oxygen in outer space. So we need some kind of propellant which carries its own oxygen. Now we've met such a propellant already in this lecture, it's gunpowder. Now gunpowder is really just a mixture of three ingredients. So the first one is charcoal. This is powdered charcoal, but it's rather like the, the sort of thing you might use on your barbecue. So charcoal functions as a fuel. The second ingredient is also a fuel. It's this beautiful yellow element, sulfur. The sulfur also functions as a fuel and it helps the gunpowder to burn a little bit faster. And then the third ingredient is very important. The third ingredient is called saltpeter, or to give it its chemical name, potassium nitrate. And potassium nitrate is an interesting chemical because it contains locked up inside it oxygen. When it's heated, the oxygen is given off and the oxygen can react with the charcoal and the sulfur and release energy. Not only does it release energy, it produces a lot of gas. So it produces hot gas with lots of energy and by ejecting that gas through a small hole called a nozzle in one direction, we can produce a rocket force in the other direction. And if you want to try this, you can buy what are called model rockets. They're on sale in, in the shops online and in hobby shops. And this is a little model rocket made from a kit. It's essentially a cardboard tube with a balsa wood nose cone and fins. And it's powered by a little gunpowder motor. And this motor powering this rocket will take the rocket to 1,500 feet. So it does this by producing lots of gas. Well, we've got an experiment over here to find out how much gas is produced by a rocket motor. So I have a slightly larger motor. And what we're going to do with this motor is to burn it underwater and collect the gas so we can see how much gas is produced. So in this apparatus, we have a tube full of water. We have another one of these motors. It's in a plastic bag so it doesn't get wet and it's underwater. And when the motor burns, it will produce gas and the gas will displace the water in this tube and we'll see just how much gas is produced. Now to set off this motor, we have an electrical match inside the motor and it's connected by these wires to uh, the thing which is really my favorite way of setting off explosives, which is this. <laughs> so this is actually a genuine um, exploder, as it's called. It's from about the 1920s and it would have been used to set off uh, dynamite in quarries and mines and that sort of thing. And so we're gonna use this to set off that rocket. But to help me, I'd like a volunteer, please. Who would like to come on down? Would you like to come on down? Let's have a big hand for our volunteer. Would you like to come and stand there? What's your name? Edward. Edward. Right, Edward. You've seen these on cartoons. Do you know what to do? Okay. Lift so it up and push exactly. It down. You can lift it up, and when I tell you, um, you need to give it a really firm push, as hard as you can. All right. And we, we're going to watch the rocket burning in that tube over there and see how much gas is produced. Okay. Off you go, Edward. And there's the motor burning. And we can see how much gas, so you can see the white gas at the top. All of that gas produced from that one small motor. All right, let's have a big hand for our volunteer. <laughs> so this gas then is produced by the combustion of uh, gunpowder inside that rocket motor. And that gas is ejected at the back, producing the rocket force going forward. Now, gunpowder is just a mixture of these three ingredients. And lots of rocket propellants, as we'll see in this lecture, are made of mixtures, mixtures of a fuel with an oxidizing material, such as oxygen. Now, when we're designing a rocket propellant, one of the most important things is to understand the right proportions of fuel and oxidizer. So to see how that works, let's look at this example here, which is the Bunsen burner. Now, a Bunsen burner works by burning methane or natural gas. So the methane is coming up this tube, it's mixing with the air, and what you're seeing here is a chemical reaction between the methane and the oxygen from the air. So we can ask ourselves, what is the best proportion of methane and oxygen to get the biggest energy release? Well, we can answer this by looking at the chemistry of this chemical reaction. So this is a model of a molecule of methane. So it consists of a carbon atom attached to four atoms of hydrogen. Now when the methane burns, the 
methane molecules react with oxygen molecules. So here's a molecule of oxygen. It has two atoms of oxygen joined by this bond. What happens when the methane burns is the bonds in these two molecules break and the atoms come together in different combinations. In particular, the carbon reacts with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. Now, as the name suggests, carbon dioxide has one atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen. So for the carbon to burn, each molecule of methane will need two atoms, in other words, one molecule of oxygen for complete combustion. So that's the carbon. What about the hydrogen? Well, there are four hydrogen atoms, and they can react with oxygen to form water. And the formula for water, as I'm sure you all know, is H2O. That's two atoms of hydrogen to each atom of oxygen. So for the hydrogen to burn completely, we have four atoms of hydrogen. They need to react with two more atoms of oxygen to make two molecules of water. So in total, for every molecule of methane, we need two molecules of oxygen. Well, that's our prediction. So let's test that prediction and see if it's correct. So we're going to do that by using these uh, 50 milliliter fizzy drinks bottles as rockets. So in each of these bottles, we have different proportions of oxygen and methane, and we'll uh, fire these rockets. And by seeing how far the rockets go, we can tell how much energy was released. So in the first rocket then, we're going to put lots and lots of methane. The methane is the fuel. So you might think having lots of methane would be a really good idea. So lots of methane, not much oxygen. <laughs> okay, I think I travelled about five centimetres. All right, maybe not so good. Let's try now having a lot more oxygen. So the, the second rocket has some methane, but lots and lots of oxygen. So let's see if this can do any better. Oh. Not bad, not bad. All right, so let's test our theory then with the third rocket, which has two parts of oxygen and one part of methane. Let's see how well this does. Okay, so clearly our scientific theory was right. If we have an exact balance between the fuel and the oxidizer, so they're in the correct proportions, we get the biggest energy release and our rocket travels the furthest. What we have there is a mixture then of the fuel, methane, and the oxidizer, oxygen. And gunpowder was also a mixture of fuel and oxidizer. We can actually do a little bit better than just have mixtures. We can actually take a molecule of fuel and actually build oxygen into the molecule. And this was discovered, first of all, by uh, a Swiss-German chemist, Schoenbein. And he was working in his kitchen, doing a bit of chemistry, sort of as you do. And he had a bit of an accident. He spilled some nitric and sulfuric acid on the bench, or on the kitchen table, I suppose. And he took a cotton cloth and he used the cloth to wipe up the acids. And then he put the cloth on the stove to dry it out. And when it dried out, he made a discovery. He discovered this material. This is called nitrocellulose. So this is just a piece of ordinary cotton cloth. It's been treated with nitric and sulfuric acids, then washed and dried. And it looks exactly the same. It looks just like ordinary cotton cloth. But if I set fire to it, you'll see it behaves um, rather differently. And you'll notice it seems to have disappeared. Of course, it hasn't disappeared. Matter can't just disappear like that. What's actually happened is it's burned very efficiently. Every molecule of cellulose has extra oxygen built in so that when it burns, the carbon turns into carbon dioxide, which is a colorless gas. The hydrogen reacts with the oxygen to form water, water vapor, another colorless gas. And there's some nitrogen produced as well. And nitrogen is just another colorless gas that's present in the atmosphere. So it's just turned into colorless gases. In fact, anything that's made of cellulose, which is really plant material, can be treated in this way and turned into nitrocellulose. And so this is just a, an ordinary sheet of paper, which has been treated um, to turn it into nitrocellulose. And it looks just like paper um, until I set fire to it. Again, it seems to disappear. So that's nitrocellulose. And we could use nitrocellulose to try to make a rocket. So here's a, 
uh, a simple rocket, it's just a tube with some fins and a nose cone, and inside is some nitrocellulose. This time it's actually made from cotton wool, it's actually the sort of cotton wool that you buy in the pharmacy. So again, it's been turned into nitrocellulose, and we'll see if this rocket can fly. <laughs> well, our rocket didn't quite reach the moon, but it, but it illustrates the point. And we can use nitrocellulose to illustrate another point as well. This is also nitrocellulose, but this nitrocellulose is in the form of a fine powder. It's called smokeless powder. It's sort of the modern equivalent of gunpowder, effectively, but it contains quite a lot more energy than gunpowder. And I put a few grams of it in, a, in a, um, a tray, and I'll just light this, and I want you to see how quickly or how slowly it burns. So you see it's burning slowly along the track. It's taking several seconds to get from one end to the other. That's burning just in the open air. But in a rocket, we take our fuel, our propellant, and we confine it in a rocket chamber and allow it to build up pressure. And that build-up of pressure does two things. It increases the rate of combustion. And also, the high pressure means the gases come out of the end at high speed, and that gives us extra thrust to our rocket. But we have a problem. If we confine that pressure too much, things can go wrong. And I want to illustrate what can go wrong with the help of another volunteer. Should we have a volunteer from this side? Um, who wants to come on down? Would you like to come down second row back? Yes, let's have a big hand for our volunteer. <clears throat> and uh, face the audience, what's your name? Jack. Jack, all right, Jack. Well, just behind you here in this, uh, in the safety hood, we have another two grams of that smokeless powder, but this time it's inside a cardboard tube, and the cardboard tube is bound up with lots of tape, so it's very tightly confined. And again, we have an electrical batch inside the tube, so we're going to set off the powder. This time it's very tightly confined. We'll find out what would happen to our rocket if we don't get the design quite right. So if you'd like to come over here. So again, we've connected it up to this um, exploder. So don't operate that just yet. My prediction is that the rate of burning of that powder will be increased so much that we're going to need ear defenders. So I'm going to give you ear defenders. I'm going to wear ear defenders. And you may wish to um, cover your ears for this. So this is two grams of that smokeless powder, just like we saw in the track, but this time very tightly confined. OK, off you go. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we actually got there was an explosion. The effect of confinement was to trap the, the heat, trap the expanding gases, the pressure builds up, the temperature builds up, and that increases the rate of combustion to such a high level that we actually get an explosion. And that's what can happen to our rockets if the design isn't quite right. So you can see rocket science can be quite tricky sometimes. Now, we've looked at the chemistry of propellants, so we're going to come back later and look again at the chemistry of propellants. But I just want to take a moment to turn and look at the physics of rocketry. And the physics of rocketry also presents us with some very interesting challenges. And to illustrate this, I'm going to need two more volunteers, please. I think in the stripy shirt, you were very quick. Yes, on the end, you'd come down. Somebody from over here, you're very keen, so why don't you come on down? And a big hand for our two volunteers, please. Right, if you'd like to turn face to front, what's your name? Louis. Louis. And you face the front, stand there, face the front, what's your name? Albert. Albert. Right, I've got two poles, and they're um, either identical, they have little pegs on the end. And what I want you to do is to balance these. So if, if you hold out a finger like that, what I want you to do is to balance that on your finger and keep it vertical. Okay, manage that. I want you to do the same thing. That's it. Turn your finger the other way up, be easier. I'm going to make it a little bit harder for you, so I'm going to turn it up this way, all right? <laughs> all right, now concentrate really hard and see if you can keep it upright, okay? Oh, oh well done. Okay, have another go, have another go. Try really hard, okay? Got it? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you both very much. Thank you. 
So what you saw there was that when we try to balance the stick this way, it's very, very easy. We call this stable. We say this stick is stable. What that means is, is that if I nudge the stick a little bit, if there's any sort of disturbance and I nudge the stick, it comes back to where it was. If the stick is displaced, it moves back to where it was before. And that's called stable. So that's very easy. When the stick is this way up, however, we call this unstable. Even if I manage to balance this and get it exactly vertical, the tiniest disturbance, as it starts to move, it keeps moving in the same direction. It moves away from where it started. We call that unstable. And the problem we face in rocketry is that all rockets are unstable. If we think about a rocket, imagine this rocket is taking off, it's going up vertically, but there'll be some little imperfection in the rocket, something that isn't quite symmetrical or a little gust of wind or something that will nudge the rocket and point it in a different direction. The problem now is that the thrust, the force, is now also pointed in a different direction. So if it starts to deviate, if it starts to change course, the thrust will propel it in the new direction and it will keep on turning. So if we just fire the rocket, it won't go in a straight line, it'll fly very erratically. And we have to solve that. And we've seen from our volunteer how to solve that. When he was balancing the, the stick, he, what he had to do was to keep moving his finger around. Okay? We call that active stabilization. And that's how big rockets work. I think one of the most impressive pieces of engineering of all time is also the largest rocket ever built that's flown successfully. It's the Saturn V and it took astronauts to the moon in the 1960s. And the Saturn V was an extraordinary piece of engineering. It was the height of a 36-story building. It weighed 3,000 tons, and the first stage burned fuel at the rate of 15 tons a second. So imagine this 36-story building lifting off the ground on five columns of flame produced by burning fuel at 15 tons a second, and the whole thing is unstable. So to stabilize it, what they had to do was have these engines, and each engine is the size of a small house, to have these engines swing backwards and forwards and be moved by gigantic hydraulic rams. So as the rocket takes off, as it starts to tilt one way, the engines are pivoted while they're burning 15 tons of fuel a second to correct the trajectory of the rocket. So it's an extraordinary piece of engineering. Now, fortunately, if we want to fly rockets in the Earth's atmosphere, we can do something that's a lot simpler. We can actually make use of the air to provide stability. And I'm going to try to demonstrate this using an experiment which will involve everybody in the lecture theatre. So, hopefully, just before the start of the lecture, you constructed these paper aeroplanes. Now, the aeroplanes are identical except for the location of the paperclip. On the red aeroplane, the paperclip is at the back, whereas on the green aeroplane, the paperclip is in the middle. So if, if you could all check that whichever colour you have, you've positioned the paperclip in the correct place. OK, what we're going to do now is the thing that you've always wanted to do, which is to throw paper aeroplanes at the lecturer. <laughs> so. I'm going to be the target. Your job is to hit me. Now, I'm going to give you a piece of advice that might make it a bit easier. When you throw a paper aeroplane, it doesn't fly horizontally, of course. It descends under gravity. So it's no good throwing them directly at me. What you need to do is to aim above my head. And I suggest you aim for the top of the white screen, and then the aeroplane should descend and reach me. Now, what we're going to do is, first of all, just throw the red dart. So just all the green darts stand down. I'm going to give you a countdown, three, two, one, go, when I say I want everybody with a red dart to try to hit me. Okay, are you ready? Red darts. Okay, three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay, oh. That's cheating. <laughs> OK, let's see what happens now if we throw the green dart. So everybody with a green dart, get ready. OK. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, well, as you can see, the darts at the front are all green. For some reason, those green darts flew a lot better than the red darts. The reason is that the green darts are stable, whereas the red darts are unstable. And I can explain why the difference occurs using a little model. So in fact, rather than using a model of an aeroplane, I'll use a model of a rocket. So this is our rocket model. And the first thing we need to understand is the, a concept called the center of mass. So if I take my rocket and I balance it on my finger, somewhere about there, I think. So the point where it balances is called the center of mass. And we can think of all of the mass of the rocket as acting at that point. And that point acts like a sort of pivot point. When the rocket is in flight, if there's some disturbance that nudges it off course, it tends to pivot around the center of mass. And so I've marked the center of mass on this rocket with this symbol. And so this is the point about which the, the rocket can pivot. The other idea we need is called the center of pressure. So let's imagine a rocket in flight. We think of the rocket as traveling very fast and the air through which it's flying as being stationary. But imagine you were flying on the rocket. You would think the rocket was stationary and you think the air was coming towards you. We call that the relative wind. So if you're on this rocket, the air is moving towards you. And so there's this wind blowing on the nose of the rocket. Now imagine the rocket is nudged slightly to one side. The wind will act on all parts of the rocket's area, but the, the overall effect of that is as if the wind was acting in one place. We call that the center of pressure. So roughly speaking, the center of pressure is the place where the area in front is the same as the area behind. So this particular rocket has the center of mass behind the center of pressure. That's a bit like your red rockets, uh, your red aeroplanes. On your red aeroplanes, you had a paper clip at the back, and that moved the center of mass behind the center of pressure. So let's see what happens to a, an aeroplane or a rocket which has its center of mass too far to the back. So here's our rocket in flight. This is the relative wind as the rocket flies through the air. But if it suffers a small disturbance, it points off in some other direction. Okay? This is unstable. As soon as it starts to change course, it's pointing all over the place. Is it flying very erratically? That's an unstable rocket or an unstable um, aeroplane. So what we need to do is to change things around a bit so that the center of mass is in front of the center of pressure. And on the paper aeroplanes, we did this by moving the paper clip from the back to the middle. So here's the center of mass, that's the pivot point. The center of pressure is the same because these shapes are the same. So let's see what happens with this rocket. It's flying in this direction and it's quite happy. If there's a disturbance, it points back towards the direction it was going. So that's why this is stable. Now, we could make our rocket stable by um, fitting giant paper clips on the front of them. And that, that, would, that would not be a very good idea. We could add lots of lead weight to the, to the nose cone but that would be very wasteful because in rockets, it's very expensive to take mass up into the sky or into space. And that mass is very precious. And we don't want to be carrying empty weight, as it were. <clears throat> so instead, we do something different. Instead of <clears throat> moving the center of mass forward, we move the center of pressure backwards. And that's why rockets have fins. The fins are to make the rocket stable. They create lots of surface area towards the back of the rocket. And they shift the center of pressure behind the center of gravity and so rockets like this are stable as long as they're flying through the Earth's atmosphere. So fins is one way to stabilize a rocket. And there's another way we can stabilize a rocket. And uh, this is very familiar to you. This is a fireworks rocket. So the fireworks rocket doesn't have fins. Instead, it has this stick. But the effect is the same. The stick creates surface area towards the back of the rocket. And that makes it stable. So if the rocket is flying through the air and suffers a little disturbance, the relative wind acts on the stick and points it back in the direction it's supposed to be going. So that makes it stable. Now, these are the sorts of rockets that you can buy in the shops. 
But if you go to a professional fireworks display, you will very rarely, if ever, see rockets being used. And the reason that professionals don't like rockets has to do with their stability. So let's imagine the following. Imagine I'm running a big professional fireworks display and I'm going to launch my fireworks from this spot. And let's imagine that there's a wind blowing. Let's say the wind is blowing from this side, so the wind is blowing across the lecture theatre like this. So I fire my fireworks into the sky and they explode and make pretty effects. And then the, the cardboard tubes and the paper and all the bits that the fireworks were made of, they come back down to the ground. And because of the wind, they'll be blown downwind and they'll land somewhere here. So we'll call that the fallout zone. Now it's very important that we don't have the fallout zone sitting on the audience. So we'll have the audience upwind, so our audience is here, and the fallout zone is downwind and everything is happy. What would happen, however, if we included a few rockets in our display? Well, let's think about this. We launch this rocket vertically, but the wind is coming from this side, so it acts on the centre of pressure, and it tips the rocket in the direction of the wind. But the rocket's still burning, so it's now going in this direction, and it's turning the whole time into wind. So rockets are very strange things, because when you launch them, they fly into the wind. So the rocket, the empty rockets are all going to land here on our audience, and we've created two fallout zones. So professionals don't really like rockets for that reason. So in a professional fireworks display, what you have are not rockets, but these things. These are called shells. This is a, a relatively large one. This is a, an eight-inch diameter shell. It's a spherical uh, container of explosives and, and firework effects. And underneath is a charge of gunpowder. It's called the lifting charge. And this whole thing is lowered into a tube called a mortar, which acts like a cannon, a cannon pointing straight up. The lifting charge explodes, propels the shell into the sky where it explodes, and all the casing and so on is nicely blown downwind into our fallout zone. So that's what's used in professional fireworks displays. While we're over here on this display, we have some other examples of rockets. We've already seen model rockets. Here's another one. So these are the kinds that you, you buy in the shops, the little gunpowder motors. But if you get interested in rocketry, and you want to start building some bigger rockets, you can. And they're called high-power rockets. And this is an example of a high-power rocket. This particular one has been to 13,000 feet, carrying a lot of electronics on board. And it's powered by this motor. Now, this motor is obviously a lot bigger than the gunpowder motor we saw before, but the propellant is also different. This contains a different oxidizer. It's called ammonium perchlorate. And the fuel is a sort of a rubbery material. It's hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene. And there will be a test at the end, in case you <laughs> don't remember. So this propellant, so-called ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, is about three times as energetic as gunpowder. And so these rockets have very high performance. And the components you see here are for a six-inch diameter rocket. So these would be assembled into a large rocket, and that would be powered by this motor, Again, full of ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, very high energy propellant. It's the same propellant as used on the boosters of the space shuttle or on any professional solid fueled rocket. And this motor is pretty much as big as you're going to be able to fly in the UK, simply because the bigger the rocket, the bigger the motor, the more space you need to bring the rocket down safely. And we sort of run out of space on our small island. But if you go to the States, where they have uh, lots of big open deserts, you can fly much, much bigger rockets even than this as an amateur. So we talked there about bringing the rocket down safely. That's tremendously important. And we always bring down the rocket nice and slowly under a parachute. The parachute behind me is the parachute that goes with this large rocket at the back. So we need a way of deploying, of, of opening that parachute. We also need to decide when to open the parachute. So let's think about a rocket that's taking off. It starts at the ground, and it, as it takes off, the, the motor burns, it gets faster and faster and faster, and then the motor runs out of fuel. So it stops burning, but the rocket's traveling very fast at this point, so it carries on climbing, perhaps to several times the height at which the motor burns out. But it's slowing down and slowing down as it climbs against gravity, and eventually it reaches the highest point, we call that the apogee, and after that, it starts to descend under gravity. 
Now, the apogee is the point at which it has the slowest speed. So that's the point where we want to open the parachute, because if we open the parachute when the rocket's traveling fast, the parachute will just be destroyed. So we want a way of opening the parachute at the highest point. And there's one way to do that, which is to use the fact that the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere falls as we go higher and higher. So if we have a system on our rocket that measures the pressure of the atmosphere, it will see the atmosphere at ground level, at liftoff. As the rocket climbs, it will measure the atmospheric pressure falling until it reaches the highest point, and then as it starts to descend, the atmospheric pressure will increase again. So by detecting the point at which the atmospheric pressure just starts to increase, we know the rocket is at the highest point, and we can set off our parachute. So, what we're going to do now is have a little demonstration of how that works. And again, I'd like the help of a volunteer, please. Let's have a volunteer. You're very keen. Let's have you. Okay. Let's have a big hand for our volunteer. Would you like to come and stand about here? Okay, what's your name? Amy. Amy. All right, Amy. What we've got is uh, a bell jar, a sealed bell jar. And inside the bell jar is a little piece of electronics. We call it an altimeter. Just wait there a second. Inside the bell jar, we've got a little piece of electronics called an altimeter, which measures the pressure of the air around it. And in a moment, we're going to reduce the pressure in the bell jar, which represents the rocket climbing. And as we start to increase the pressure again, it should detect that the rocket, if you like, has reached the highest point, and it will deploy the parachute. Now, the way it deploys the parachute is by sending an electrical signal to an explosive charge that blows off the nose cone and ejects the parachute. And we're going to simulate that by connecting our altimeter through wires to a little pyrotechnic device that sat on top of the fume hood there. So if that goes off, that's equivalent to the parachute being deployed. All right, well, if we'd like to um, come and just stand here, just swap places, if you stand there, and this... Um, syringe is going to allow us to change the pressure in the bell jar. So what I want you to do is get hold of this with your left hand, uh, other hand, that's it. Hold that with your right hand. Then what I want you to do is to pull the plunger this way, a few centimetres. That's it, about there. And now push it back in again. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. So that's how we deploy the parachutes on our rocket. Now, we looked earlier at rocket fuels. We looked in particular at gunpowder as a fuel that we can use to propel uh, small model rockets. And we also looked at ammonium perchlorate-based uh, propellants, which are much more powerful and they're used on large uh, high-power rockets for amateurs and on large professional rockets as well. Those are both examples of solid fuels. The fuels, the propellants, are in solid form. And they have a really nice advantage, which is that they're very simple. When you set fire to a solid motor, it burns, it does its thing. That's all you need to do, just set fire to it. But it also has a disadvantage. Once you've ignited your solid fuel motor, you cannot shut it down. Nor can you control the thrust. It produces whatever thrust it produces, you have no control over that. Often, we want to be able to change the thrust of an engine in flight. For instance, if we're landing on the moon, we need to adjust the throttle of the, the engine in order to achieve a nice soft landing. Also, if there's a problem in flight, we might want to shut the engine off very quickly. We can't do that with a solid fuel motor. So a lot of large rockets use not solids, but liquids. They use liquid fuels and liquid oxidizers. And these have the advantage that we can control them, we can shut them down quickly, and also they have even more energy than the best solid fuels. So let's have a look at some liquid propellants for rockets. Now, the most common oxidizer for liquid fuel rockets is just oxygen itself. But oxygen, of course, is a gas. The air in this lecture theatre is about one-fifth oxygen, and it has a very low density. There isn't much oxygen in a, in a given volume. We need to find some way of packing it in so we can fit a lot of oxygen into our rocket. And the way we do that is by cooling down the oxygen. If we cool it down enough to around minus 183 degrees centigrade, it will turn into a liquid. 
And we can achieve that by using another very cold liquid called liquid nitrogen, which uh, has an even lower boiling point, and we can use that to cool down oxygen gas and turn it into a liquid. And that's what's happening here. So in this cylinder, we have oxygen gas. It's coming out of this tube. It's going through a, a bath of liquid nitrogen, and the liquid nitrogen is cooling it down so it becomes a liquid, and it's collecting in this uh, vacuum flask. So I thought I'd just show you some liquid nitrogen. So in this box is some hot water, and in this vacuum flask is about a litre of liquid nitrogen. So this is extremely cold, and I'll pour the cold liquid nitrogen into the hot water, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so that's, that's got nothing whatever to do with rocket science, by the way. I just couldn't resist um, <laughs> including it in the lecture. So in this vacuum flask, then, we've made some liquid oxygen. So it's a very compact, very high-density form of oxygen. And so it should be a much better oxidizer than just the oxygen in the air. And we can test that with a little um, experiment. I'm going to set fire to something which ordinarily doesn't burn terribly well, and we'll see if we can speed up its burning. And the thing we're going to use is toast. So a piece of toast. So I'm putting the toast in a tray, and then uh, Chris is going to pass me the liquid oxygen. And I'm pouring liquid oxygen onto the toast. I guess in the spirit of the science vessel, I'm going to be quite generous with this. So there's our toast soaked with liquid oxygen and now we'll set fire to it and see how well it burns in this very concentrated form of oxygen. And it's worth remembering, every time you eat a piece of toast, <clears throat> the amount of energy that's released in your body is exactly the same as the amount of energy that you see being released there. It's just released rather more slowly. <laughs> so that's liquid oxygen. And liquid oxygen is often used as the oxidizer in liquid-propelled rockets, together with fuels. A common fuel is kerosene, very much like the fuel that powered our jet engine earlier on. Or we may use <clears throat> another very, very cold material, liquid hydrogen. That's hydrogen gas that's been turned into a liquid, again by cooling to very low temperatures. So those are examples of liquid fuels. But there's a special type of liquid fuel that we use under special situations. Let's go back to the 1960s and imagine our astronauts have landed on the moon. They've gone for a moonwalk, they've taken some photographs, they've collected some moon rocks. And the time has come to return back to the Earth. Now, because there isn't very much weight allowance on a spacecraft, they've only got one rocket engine to bring them home. So that rocket engine has to work. It has to be an extremely reliable rocket engine. And the way we can make an extremely reliable rocket engine is to change the chemistry of the propellants. If we choose our propellants very carefully, then we don't need a source of ignition. We call this hypergolic. It means that when we mix the fuel and the oxidizer, they will ignite without any external source of ignition. And that's good if you want to build a very reliable rocket engine, because it means you can do away with all of the ignition systems. You just have a tank of fuel, a tank of oxidizer, uh, and some pipes and valves connecting them to the engine. Now, the actual hypergolic fuels used on the Apollo spacecraft that, uh, that went to the moon, they used uh, an oxidizer called nitrogen tetroxide, and they used a fuel called hydrazine. Now, nitrogen tetroxide is quite an unpleasant material, but we've got a small quantity in this test tube. It's the brown liquid in the bottom of the test tube. Hydrazine is extremely nasty, and we won't be able to demonstrate that today in the lecture theater. So we're going to use something a little bit different. It's called aniline, but it has the same property. Aniline combined with nitrogen tetroxide will be hypergolic. <coughs> So 
I'm just going to put on some safety equipment. <clears throat> I think we'll dim the lights a little bit for this. So we have nitrogen tetroxide in the test tube and I'm now going to inject some aniline through this syringe. So as you saw there, as soon as you mix the aniline and the nitrogen tetroxide, they ignited and they're actually quite violent. I think anybody who's sat on the moon and knows that the only way of getting back home is the several tons of hypergolic propellants underneath their feet is certainly a very brave person. So those are hypergolic propellants. They're again examples of liquid fuels. So we've seen solid fuels, which are very good because when you... Um, when you want to use them, you just light them and they just work. There's no further, um, no further action needed. They're very, very simple. We've seen that liquid fuels are good because you can change the throttle of the engine just by controlling the amount of fuel you inject into the engine, and you can shut the engine down very quickly if you need to. So the question is, can we get the best of both worlds? Can we have a rocket engine which is somehow powered by a combination of a solid and a liquid. And we can, we call this a hybrid rocket motor. And we'll demonstrate a hybrid rocket motor in a moment. First of all, we just need to think a little bit about what we're gonna use for the fuel and the oxidizer. So in this cylinder, I have a colorless gas. And the colorless gas has an interesting property, which I'll demonstrate. I'm gonna light this splint and then I'm going to blow out the splint so that it's just glowing and put it into the gas. And you notice the splint relights. I'll do that again. So a glowing splint into the gas and it relights the splint. Anybody know the name of this gas? Yes. Pure oxygen. oxygen. That's a great answer. Oxygen's a great answer. I'll tell you, this is actually a bit of a trick question because in school, of course, and you're obviously paying attention in school, you're taught that if you have a colourless gas and it relights a glowing splint, the gas is oxygen. Well, it's a bit of a trick question because this is another colourless gas that will relight a glowing splint. It's not, in fact, oxygen. It's called nitrous oxide. And the common name of this is laughing gas. So if you're unfortunate enough to... Um, have an accident, perhaps you've broken a leg or something, and you're being taken to the hospital in an ambulance, and you complain to the ambulance crew that you're in some pain, they might give you a bit of nitrous oxide to breathe because it's an anaesthetic and it will help to numb the pain. We've also seen that it's quite a good oxidizer because it relights that glowing splint. And we're going to show you another demonstration now of nitrous oxide as an oxidizer. And this is actually one of my favorite chemistry demonstrations. It's called the barking dog experiment. So in this glass tube, we have nitrous oxide. So that's going to be our oxidizer. And our fuel is uh, this colorless liquid. It's called carbon disulfide. So I'm going to place some carbon disulfide into the tube. And then Gary is going to shake the tube. And this will allow the carbon dioxide to evaporate. So what we have now is a mixture of carbon disulfide vapor with nitrous oxide. And when we've clamped it back in the stand, uh, I'm going to set fire to this and we'll see what sort of effect we get. And again, I think we'll dim the lights for this, Chris. So once the lights are down. <laughs> So that's nitrous oxide. So that's going to be our oxidizer for our hybrid rocket motor. And nitrous oxide has another really nice property. If you compress it, it turns into a liquid. And it does that at room temperature. So we can have liquefied nitrous oxide at room temperature. We don't have to have all the complexity of cooling things down to very low temperatures like we did with liquid oxygen. So nitrous oxide is going to be our oxidizer. And our fuel for this 
rocket engine is going to be this. It's acrylic, sometimes known as perspex. It's a clear plastic. It's got a hole up the middle and it's going to burn from the inside outwards. And the nice thing about this is that because it's a clear plastic, we will actually be able to see the combustion happening inside the combustion chamber itself. So we have another piece of the um, acrylic tube mounted in this um, rocket engine. At one end we have an injector, that's a hole through which we can inject nitrous oxide, and at the other end we have a graphite nozzle, and that will um, accelerate the gases coming out of the chamber to very high speed and produce a thrust, not a very big one, but some thrust in that direction. So we're going to connect up the nitrous oxide. I'll switch this on. I'll just purge the engine with nitrous oxide. And I'm going to light it, and I'm just going to do that with a, a wooden splint. This obviously is just a demonstration engine. On a, a real engine for flight, it would have a different system of ignition that would ignite it very rapidly. But this is suitable for demonstrations. So what we're doing now is letting a bit of nitrous oxide into the combustion chamber. And it just takes a few moments to, to get going, but the inside wall of the acrylic tubing is beginning to, um, beginning to burn. And once the flame has spread throughout the tube, you see that I can control the rate of combustion by just controlling the rate at which we let nitrous oxide into the combustion chamber. And then if we could just bring the lights down, Gary, once the lights are down, we'll then take this up to full power. Well, thank you very much. That, that almost brings us to the end of the lecture. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to finish with one last demonstration of the application of rocket science. Thank you very much.
Saturn is near Delta Capricorn and is now an evening sky object. And as out there before, it is actually in a position that can be viewed. It's, uh, it's probably up about there now. So uh, finally getting the payments back. Uh, Comet Pan Stars, 1.7 degrees northwest of Zeta Ophiuchi. Now Ophiuchus is actually between Scorpio and Sagittarius, so two fairly easy to find constellations. So uh, it's up there. Um, if the telescope will go to Zeta Ophiuchi, well, it's fairly close to it, it's only about three thumbnails away. Uh, should be reasonably uh, easy to see, and a little bit more about Pan Stars later. A couple of uh, meteor showers this month, uh, or occur for a period of time. We've got the Delta Aquarius and the Alpha Capricornus. And uh, apparently the Delta Aquarius is pretty spectacular. The Alpha Capricornus don't quite have as many, but uh, are also quite uh, worth watching. Uh, on the 2nd of the 8th we had Uranus, about 1.5 degrees. Uh, north of Mars. Now for those with a telescope big enough to discern Uranus, you're going to have a blue planet and a red planet right next to each other. So it might be a little bit of a photo op for, for the astrophotographers, certainly for the visual astronomers, something to have a, a bit of a look at. Uh, on the 11th to the 8th, the moon is at perigee. Uh, and on the 12th we have another full moon, which will be another super moon. Not as spectacular as the one this month. The one this month was the one that was uh, closest to this year. So, so the sky looking to the south, you've uh, got the uh, ecliptic plane here, which is generally where most of your planets will go from, uh, rising in the east and moving over to the to the west. Uh, Saturn's up here. Uh, in Cap uh, right on the bottom of Capricornus now, so as you can see, um, July 15th, which is fairly close to us, about 10 pm, it's in a fairly good position uh, to view, so about now. The Delta Aquarius, not too hot, this is quite cheap, I suppose, uh, they come obviously out of uh, their name for Aquarius, which is, this is about the uh, axis I've come from. And the Capricornids come from about the, uh, the top part of uh, Capricorn there. Now what, what this is, is that that's where you look, that's where you'll see the, the meteors, they tend to come from that part of the sky. Um, most meteors tend, or showers tend to be best viewed uh, in the morning, and the reason for that is the morning is the direction the Earth's heading into space, so we run into them rather than away from them. Uh, other things of interest, uh, you've got the Triffid Nebula uh, and the Lagoon Nebula uh, up here, uh, near Sagittarius. Sagittarius is the centre of the galaxy, so you do have a lot of stars there, and uh, sometimes make a few things a bit uh, hard to see. Uh, 47 Takana, still in a very good position to, uh, to look at. And over here you've got either Carina Nebula, uh, Carina Nebula, that's the one that uh, the James West telescope photographed. So uh, if you want to put a telescope on it, guarantee one thing, it won't be that speed. Right, uh, looking to the north, uh, not a lot of a difference obviously. Uh, up there to the north you, you have Hercules, uh, down here with M13 in it um, and M15. Now these are both globular clusters and uh, this gives you a bit of a better idea. If you're looking to the north, the Alpha Capricorn is going to be coming from the right hand side. Okay, so the planets, Mercury moves through superior conjunction on the 17th. Uh, which was three nights ago, so it's gone be at the other side of the sun from where Earth is. Um, obviously, Mercury and Venus, being inferior planets, both have, have two conjunctions, whereas all the outer planets have a conjunction and an opposition. Uh, it's fairly fast moving, 
So uh, late July, early August, it'll return to the evening sky, and that's just the way it, uh, way it works. It's supposed to get a reasonable uh, height above it, about seven degrees above the horizon, so it should be fairly easy to spot, and it is a naked eye object. Uh, Venus, still a morning object in the eastern sky, uh, it's in Taurus, and fairly close to the Pleiades and the high eight uh, clusters, uh, which are both in Taurus there. Um, not too far from uh, Eldebrin, and uh, apparently you've got a very bright planet and a big red star fairly, fairly close proximity. Earth was at Apelion on the uh, 4th of the 7th, uh, basically means it was as far from the sun as it gets in its orbit, which probably helps explain why the temperature is extremely cold at the moment. Uh, so hopefully if you start to move towards uh, Perihelion, uh, the weather will uh, get warmer. Perihelion, of course, occurs during the southern hemisphere's summer, which is why our summers tend to be a little more intense than uh, what the northern one does. Like you if you're in England at the moment, I don't think it gets much more intense. England's just had their first 40 degree day. Mars uh, is rising about 1am in the eastern sky in Aries. Uh, it's still a morning object. Uh, rising basically means it's on the horizon, so you probably have to wait uh, until about 2 o'clock before you'll be able to see it. Uh, the one advantage of Mars is because we're actually, we catch Mars, we chase Mars and we eventually catch it and overtake it, as opposed to the two inner planets which run away from us. Uh, so that basically means over the next few months Mars is going to get bigger and it will move or into our evening sky. Uh, it reaches opposition in December, which is the best time to, to view Mars. You only get opposition every two years with Mars, so uh, if you've really got an interest in Mars and trying to have a look at it, you, uh, you need to be ready for December. Uh, Jupiter is now rising late in the evening. Uh, it's probably not far off the horizon now. It is following uh, Saturn uh, a, a little bit. Uh, those who remember it two years ago, it was very close together with Saturn, but Jupiter moves through its orbit a little faster than Saturn. Uh, Jupiter moves about um, 30 degrees a year, and Saturn only moves about uh, 15 uh, degrees, so that's why they're separated. Uh, Saturn now rising mid evening it's in Capricorn and it is up at the moment so uh, it's pretty clear skies out there and I'm pretty certain Greg will be out there with the, with the uh, lid of the observatory open so opportunity to go and uh, catch up with Saturn for the first time this year. Uh, Uranus found in Aries rising about 2.30 a.m. so it's still a morning object. All of these uh, are sort of in a bit of a trail, they're all in about the same part of the sky, so over the next few months you're pretty much going to have all the, the gas planets come into view, along with Mars, uh, Venus, uh, I think not, uh, by the next month or the month after goes through superior conjunction, doesn't quite move as fast as Mercury, so it'll be a little bit laggy, um, but you're almost going to be able to get another eight planet view opportunity probably later this year. And Neptune rising about 10 pm at the moment. Uh, Neptune obviously is a telescope object and uh, should be a little hard to, to pick out uh, from the rest of them. Here it's the planets. Okay, if you look at Mercury, you'll see uh, on the 5th of July it's got the shadow on the right hand side of the disk. That's because uh, you imagine the sun here, it's going behind the sun, so we're looking at the face with the shadow on that side. On the 30th of July, once it's gone through some period of conjunction, it pops out the other side, and so that face is on the sun, and you've got the shadow on the other side there. So that's why you've got the shadow on two different uh, sides. Venus being a morning object is, is still disappearing around behind the sun, and so the shadow is on the right hand side. Um, Venus obviously gets much bigger as it uh, goes towards inferior conjunction or uh, coming back towards us in the evening and that sort of stuff. But you get more shadow, so you see it towards the present. 
Marge, uh, still see the shadow on that side there because it's kind of a bed of the sun there. Mars is kind of around here from us at the moment. We'll be going to actually catch up and move between the sun. And that's going to be in opposition to the bar. Saturn, uh, rings are closing a little bit now. They're about 14 degrees. This time last year they were about 17 degrees. So uh, the reason for that is we are approaching in, the, well, in 2025, uh, we'll go through the ring plane. It's basically the, it's like a big gyroscope, the rings stay at the same uh, position, aligned with the sun, and we will move, as we move through that plane, we won't see the rings, and then they will um, reappear. Uh, Jupiter, don't have to worry about rings, it does have a ring system but you can't really see it. Uh, always puts on a fairly good show though Jupiter. Uh, being relatively close to it is quite large, it's uh, very easy one to find. Uranus, not much more than a little green dot, 5.8 magnitude, it's probably kids have got eyes good enough to see it, us older people haven't. Okay, so we need a telescope. And Neptune at uh, 7.9 magnitude is definitely a telescope object. Uh, the other stuff this month, uh, as I said earlier, comet pan stars is reaching about 6 magnitude, which is fairly bright for a lot of comets. Most of the ones that have happened so far this year have been around about 9th, 10th, and 11th magnitude. I think Leonard was about uh, the only one that was actually visible to the naked eye. Uh, it's in uh, Ophiuchus, where it will remain until August, uh, and then it moves into Scorpio. So it's actually in some very easy to find constellations. Scorpio is a very easy to identify one. Uh, Ophiuchus is not that easy, but just remember Ophiuchus is between Scorpio and Sagittarius. Uh, Big July, quite close to week 10, which is a globular cluster, uh, obviously in the Ophiuchus Scorpio area. And uh, they'll be less than a degree apart, so less than two thumb widths uh, apart. Meteor showers are some of the uh, southern Delta Aquarians, they're from the 12th and the 7th, so they're there now. Uh, they're occurring now uh, until the 23rd of the 8th. It's one of the most consistent showers with about 25 meteors per hour, so uh, that's uh, not quite two a minute. They so reasonably expect to see those ones. Uh, the maximum occurs on the 30th of this month. Uh, that's the maximum is 25 meters per hour. Per hour. Uh, if you want to have a look for meteors, good uh, opportunity will be that 30th. And the Alpha Capricorn is from the 3rd of the 7th until the 15th of the 8th, so they're also active at the moment. And their maximum is on the 30th of the 7th as well. Now the real beauty, as I said, is uh, it's a new moon on the 29th, so you'll have no moon interfering with your meteor watching. Uh, the Alpha Capricornids tend to be uh, fairly bright, slow meteors, occasional fireball, and uh, their highest rate's about five per hour, so not quite as productive as the other one. Nice information. Divide by astronomy 2022 by uh, those three kids. Uh, I'm not sure whether Simon's still got a couple for sale, but he is uh, disappearing in the park. Uh, any questions? What direction are the media shares again? Um, okay. Go back to that one there. So if you look, to the, look to the south, which is that direction there. Yep. All right. Then just on the side of the ecliptic plane, so we're going to be fairly uh, ecliptic kind of arc across sort of arcs across like that. Yep. So uh, in terms of that, they're going to be uh, in the eastern sky, so out there and, and up there. So they'll be reasonably high where they're coming from. Uh, at the rise. So if you were to go home, at uh, your home, just look to the south, yep. they should be uh, fairly... South East. Yeah, yeah, south, uh, south east, yeah. Towards the morning. But fairly high, fairly high up around about the ecliptic. Which, to help with the ecliptic, uh, the moon travels on the, pretty close to the ecliptic. All the planets travel pretty close to the ecliptic as well. So, the moment you've got Saturn uh, in a good spot, 
bit size, and see if it's up about there at the moment. Yeah. So that'll give you a bit of an idea of where your ecliptic is. And these showers are just either side and then these ones give you a hemisphere. Yeah, that would be sort of around where Jupiter would be as well, wouldn't that? Sorry? Like if, if they're sort of in the east and the early morning, or so around the morning, Jupiter's around about that sort of area as well at that time, isn't it? Um, at the moment, Saturn, Saturn is sort of tacked on the end of Capricorn there, yeah. and Jupiter is now it's probably uh, on the horizon now. So it's not that far behind. Um, Saturn, they've obviously separated a little bit over the two years. Um, what did I say? Saturn moves at about 12 degrees of arc per year, so it's moved 24 degrees, and Saturn moves at 30 degrees, so it's moved 60, so just over 30 degrees apart, about 36 degrees apart. Yeah. So, um, yeah, probably there to about there. Right, so that chart's so, uh, 11 p.m. Is that right? Uh, July 15th, 10 p.m. Uh, so if you're looking in the morning, then they'd be on the west, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah that, that view of the sky occurs on the 15th at 10 p.m. So now, that's how it is now. Yeah. Alright, on the August 1st, it'll occur, that'll be the view at 9 p.m. Okay, so if you're looking for the meteor showers in the morning, yeah. they'll be towards the southwest. Well, they will, yeah. On the 30th, uh, which is obviously uh, just before this one here, uh, they're probably going to be uh, even a little higher. I don't think they'll be southwest, but I really think that one's probably only going to be about here, and that one will be about here. But relatively, to, you know, if you've got Capricorn here, it'll be on the tip of Capricorn, and this one here is going to be down below, or as part of that, that's, that's where is there, the Pisces. Uh, I'm trying to think which one is the easiest to, to spot there. Um, yeah, none of them are real easy constellations. Uh, you know, Scorpio and Orion, you can sort of spot them pick fairly easily. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, you can think to look for as these brighter stars here, and you know one's at the tip, at the, the tip and the other one's a little bit off, probably about as far as getting the length of it to the bottom. But if you're looking in that area, you're going to see them. Uh, they're, they're not going to, it's not the sort of thing you need to be looking directly at. If you're looking at that part of the sky, mm -hmm. you uh, you'll be able to see Yeah, I always seem to be facing the other way if they have it. Yes, yeah, it's really got to go, oh, look at that. Look, look, it's gone. We did see Saturn at the start of the month. Sorry? We saw Saturn at the start of the month. Oh, Saturn's up now? Yeah, we saw it. Oh, you, weeks had, oh okay, yeah. you had a look earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, so the first time I saw it, so I was... Yeah, really? Yeah. You're pretty your first time you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. That sort of stuff. And, but, as I said, Jupiter's not far behind it, so over the next few months, you're actually going to be able to do a bit of planetary yeah, yeah. observing. Uh, right. They all seem to be in the same part of the sky at the moment, uh, particularly all the outer ones. Uh, Mars does its own thing a little bit. The four gas planets, they not a lot separated here. They will sort of, Jupiter will lead off, uh, Saturn will follow it, and then uh, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus takes 84 years to go around the sun, so. It doesn't travel much arc at all. It's why it's in Aries for until 2025. So uh, it's going to take it's going to take up to about six years just to transit one constellation. Um, and then it's even slower. So, uh, they will will sort of part and we'll start getting a better spread of them. But the last two years they've all kind of been in the, in the same point. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, brother.
Here's a fun question that not only have I myself asked, but I actually get asked this quite often. Why do we hear a call out like Roger Roll or Roll Program Complete, at which point we see the rocket rotate or roll on its X axis? The best example of this, I think, was the space shuttle, which had a really obvious and really dramatic roll program. As soon as it cleared the tower, you can see it making a very impressive and sometimes scary looking roll. Now, a maneuver like this makes sense when a vehicle's asymmetrical, like a space shuttle. But why do cylindrical rockets like a Saturn V or Titan or Atlas or Delta IV, why do they even bother doing a roll? I mean, can't rockets just tip over and go in whatever direction they need to go? Do a little pitch here, a little yaw there. As long as the pointy end is going in the direction it's intended to go, who cares which side of the rocket is facing the Earth and which side is facing space, right? So today, first we'll define the pitch, yaw, roll, and their corresponding axes on a rocket. Then we're going to dive into why a rocket rolls in the first place, take a look at launch azimuths and their relationships to trajectories, and then we'll look at some unique solutions to orientations, including some rockets that don't roll on ascent to align with their trajectories at all. Where at first the reason feels kind of perplexing, then you hear one explanation and you're like, oh, I guess that makes sense. But then you think of some other reasons and learn of all these weird little edge cases and come to find out there's actually a lot to unpack here. And just to clarify things, we're specifically talking about the roll program of rockets and not their gravity turn. These are two totally different things. We're focusing on this, not this. This, not this. So let's start off with a quick overview of pitch, yaw, and roll, and how they correspond on a rocket. You may have heard the terms pitch, yaw, and roll, especially when talking about airplanes. On an airplane, pitch is the nose pulling up or diving down, yaw is the nose going left or right, and roll, you can think of the wing tips going up or down while the nose stays in the same place. With airplanes, it's really easy to define pitch, yaw, and roll because airplanes have really obvious characteristics like wings, landing gear, a cockpit, and a vertical stabilizer. And you might think, how do you define these dimensions on a cylindrical rocket? Although a rocket is pretty symmetrical, it's still vital to define these dimensions. I mean, otherwise your rocket might go north instead of east or something. So let's take a jetliner and just remove the wings and tail stabilizer. Hey, look, the fuselage kind of looks like a rocket. Perfect. So now we still have our pitch, yaw, and roll. We just stand this baby up on its tail and let it rip. This was literally true when cockpits were put on missiles, which is basically all the Vostok, Mercury, Gemini, Soyuz programs were. So now with a rocket on the launch pad, we can look at the cockpit for that same pitch, yaw, and roll. When sitting in the cockpit, your pitch or your nose up and down is rotating on the Y axis, yawing left or right is rotating on the Z axis, and rolling left or right is on the X axis. Unlike an airplane, the pitch, yaw, and roll of a rocket generally isn't controlled by wings or fins, but it's actually controlled by the engine itself via a gimbal and perhaps some auxiliary thrusters to help control roll. However, wings and fins are sometimes used for stability in the atmosphere. A single engine on the bottom of a rocket can only provide two axes of control, that's pitch and yaw. And this is because the engine goes through the center of the rocket. Because of that, it can only apply torque on two axes. So in order for most single engine rockets to have roll control, you'll normally see auxiliary thrusters stuck on the side or the outer perimeter of the rocket. These auxiliary thrusters are called vernier thrusters, and I think they're the most obvious on the original Atlas SM-65A rocket. And there's several vernier thrusters on the bottom of the Soyuz rockets as well. But some single-engined rockets get clever and control their roll via the gas generator exhaust, like the RS-68 on the Delta IV and Delta IV Heavy. You can see the engineers cleverly point and steer the dual gas generator exhaust on each side of the engine for roll control. Now, if you need to brush up on gas generator cycles and the open cycle, I recently did a really in-depth rundown of a few common engine cycles in my Is SpaceX's Raptor Engine the King of Rocket Engines video. Both rockets that have at least two engines or at least two combustion chambers like the RD-180 on the Atlas V, you can point the engines in opposite directions, which will induce your X-axis roll. Okay, so now that we know how a rocket can control its roll, now we can get into why a rocket needs to control its roll. Well, to begin, a rocket needs to remain stable throughout flight so it doesn't spin so fast it tears itself apart. 
mean, okay, sure, that's the most basic reason of why the rocket needs to control its roll, but we still get to the question of why do they intentionally roll once they get off the launch pad? So I'm going to tell you the reason here, then we're going to dive in and I'm going to define a few more things. The rocket rolls to align itself to its flight azimuth, so its flight path becomes a simple pitch program. <laughs> we have a lot to unpack in just that one sentence, huh? So first, let's talk about the azimuth. Now, depending on the destination of the payload, rockets need to head to a very specific orbit. And a fun reminder here, I like to say to go to space, you go up, but to stay in space, you need to go sideways really, really fast, which really that's all orbit is. And now to get to your desired orbit, you want to make sure that that sideways part of your flight is pointing in a very, very specific and accurate direction. Now, if you were to launch a rocket right on the equator straight east, not only would you take full advantage of the Earth's rotation, which gives the rocket a nice little boost, but you'd also place your vehicle on a zero degree inclination. It's like a nice little belt around the Earth's equator. Or another fun example of inclination is the International Space Station, which is on a 51.6 degree inclination. Now it's on this exact inclination so the Russians can participate and they can launch without dropping boosters on China or without doing a costly dogleg maneuver. And just as a reference, if you launched straight east out of Kennedy Space Center, you'd be on a 28.6 degree inclination, which you may notice is the exact latitude of the Space Center. So here's where we get to what your azimuth is. The azimuth is basically if you're holding a compass on the launch pad, which direction do you want the rocket to go to get to your desired orbit? But we should pause here for a second and clear up one thing because this definitely confused me a bit. Let's be sure and note the difference between the azimuth and the inclination. The azimuth is what's on the nav ball inside a cockpit. You know, north on the nav ball is zero degrees, while east is 90, south is 180 degrees, and west is 270. Now this does not line up with the inclinations. A zero degree inclination is due east on the equator while a polar orbit is inclined 90 degrees. But again, minimum inclination depends on your latitude. So flying due east will only correspond to a zero degree inclination if you're launching on the equator. And another side note, all prograde orbits or orbits that follow the rotation of the Earth are between zero and 90 degrees inclination. If the rocket is flying south from the equator, it's still between zero and 90 degrees because inclination is really just a measure in degrees how far off angle the orbit is from the equator. And of course, it's not quite just as simple as this. If you want to go to 51.6 degrees and rendezvous with the International Space Station, you don't actually point at 51.6 degrees. You actually point at about 45 degrees. But now we're getting into some kind of fun math that takes into account the Earth's rotation and spherical trigonometry, which might be getting a little too far into the weeds for this video. So now that we know that rockets don't all follow the same path to get to space and to their destinations, we're starting to get some of the puzzle pieces as to why they might intentionally roll. For our next clue, we need to look no further than the launch pads themselves. And since we've mentioned rockets like the Space Shuttle and the Saturn V, Let's take a look at one of the most famous launch pads in the world. A launch pad that saw lots of launches from both these vehicles, and now SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Of course, I'm talking about Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. LC-39A is a great example because it's perfectly lined north, south, east, and west. Take a look here. We can see the flame trench and the crawler way perfectly runs north and south. So let's start off with the Saturn V, which first launched from 39A on its inaugural test flight on November 9th, 1967, and last launched Skylab on May 14th, 1973. With vehicle crawled out on the pad, you'll see the launch umbilical tower on the north side with its crew axis arm that swings around and connects to the east side of the rocket. This is where the astronauts get in, and once they're in, they're facing with the top of their heads due east and their feet due west. So of course, along with the command module, the rest of the vehicle had certain features, such as the fuel and electrical umbilicals that connected the rocket to the launch umbilical tower, it had some external raceways which had some important wiring and all that kind of stuff, but most importantly when talking about the alignment of the rocket was a thing called the IMU. The IMU, or the instrument unit, sat on top of the Saturn V's third stage, which housed the rocket's guidance systems. This included a digital computer, 
pretty big deal at the time, an analog flight control computer, accelerometers, and some gyroscopes. So in the case of the Saturn V heading to the moon, the launch azimuth was 72 degrees, which is 18 degrees north of due east. So while on the launch pad, the flight path and the belly of the rocket were 18 degrees off from each other. And here's where we get to the first reason for the roll program. Now, instead of moving the entire launch pad to just face the belly of the rocket at that 18 degree angle, the rocket could simply perform a roll to basically zero out the difference between the flight path and the body's physical coordinates. It would have a value that's a nice, easy zero. Now, all the rocket has to do is pitch over. This made it so the computer really only had to calculate one set of numbers instead of two, making the math and the calculations much, much easier. Less variables equals a good thing. It's nice to keep it simple. Another physical consideration is a thing called gimbal lock. Now, gimbals can freely rotate on all three dimensions and align themselves to a fixed position in space, which can then tell the guidance computers where the vehicle is pointing. Now, by zeroing out one of those numbers, you're keeping the gimbal as far away from potential gimbal lock as possible. And a gimbal that locks up can be a very, very bad thing. So in order to demonstrate why zeroing out a vehicle's roll is a good thing, let's just build a quick rocket in Kerbal Space Program. Now, by default, when you build a rocket, it's aligned perfectly north, south, east, and west, with pitch aligned north and south, and yaw aligned east and west. So to head out on an equatorial zero degree inclination orbit, you need to press only a single key, the right amount. And in this example, that is the D key, which will yaw over due east. Just one finger flying, nice and easy. Now let's rotate the rocket about 20 degrees or so away from being perfectly aligned and still try and follow that perfectly zero degree inclination due east. Now, this can still easily be done when you're super, super talented like me, obviously, <laughs> but all kidding aside, you're only using two keys this time, but it is noticeably harder. So why not just keep it simple? Well, here's another example that's a fun thought experiment. This is a map of downtown Waterloo, Iowa. Notice that the streets run from northeast to southwest and from northwest to southeast, and they're aligned to the river and not aligned to true north. Now, if you're walking around, it's probably unlikely that you wouldn't just redefine your own coordinates in your head and start thinking of anything on this side of the river as north and anything on this side as south. It just makes navigating a lot easier than thinking about northeast and southwest. So if the rocket and the launch pad are always in a fixed position, which, spoiler alert, they pretty much always are, well, kind of, we'll talk about that more in a second. The easiest thing to do is to program the rocket to do a quick roll to align itself with its azimuth. This takes the navigation from being a three-dimensional equation to just a two-dimensional equation and removes a ton of complexity and variables. I know it doesn't seem like much, but it definitely matters. Now, of course, whether the vehicle pitches or yaws is a bit pedantic because doesn't someone just define that? <laughs> Well, there's still some other important distinctions. Sticking with Apollo, the astronauts' heads were pointing due east on the launch pad. They were actually on the belly of the Saturn V. But here's a fun fact. Do you actually know the command module and the Saturn V had exactly opposite Y and Z coordinates? I don't exactly know why, but I think that's kind of interesting. But this meant when the rocket pitched over, the commander could look out the small port window in the blast protective cover and get a visual reference of their orientation. So by zeroing out the roll, the horizon would appear across the window, which made it easy to use as a reference. This also made it so if the commander saw the ground suddenly coming up or the horizon spinning, they may have considered aborting or at least had a good visual reference on whether or not that'd be necessary. Another reason why there's usually a defined belly of a rocket is to place the radio antennas and the receivers in the optimal place to have best contact with the ground during ascent. This is especially true with the space shuttle, which if it had ascended with the orbiter on top of the external fuel tank, it would have had a much worse line of sight. While we're talking about the space shuttle, its roll program was even more necessary due to its unique shape. Not only was it structurally the best option for the wings and the struts holding the external fuel tank, but by flying with the orbiter in the wake of the external fuel tank, there was actually a 20% increase in payload capacity. And although most rockets look relatively symmetrical, they almost always have some kind of protruding feature. I mean, take a look at the Saturn V. It had very large bumps and bulges on the outside that definitely aren't insignificant when factoring in the ascent profile. You'll see these areas where additional piping or wiring is housed inside sections called raceways. 
You notice there are two different raceways on each side of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy cores. You can tell the two outer cores of the Falcon Heavy are 180 degrees opposite of each other because of those two different raceways. But back to the space shuttle. The shuttle controlled its pitch and roll via gimbling nozzles on the solid rocket boosters. I mean, yes, the main space shuttle engines could gimbal too, and gimbal a lot, but they primarily gimbaled to maintain the center of thrust going through the center of mass. By using the solid rocket boosters to control pitch, the gimbal vectors are in line with each other relative to the center of mass. This probably makes it easier to control. This is also relevant to multi-core rockets like the Falcon Heavy and the Delta IV Heavy, which both have a roll program which again aligns the cores kind of perpendicular to the flight path. Now this might not be a huge deal or not, but let's just take a look at a vehicle like this and if it were flying with its engines in a row perpendicular to the horizon, the engines that are on the top and the bottom would have a different amount of leverage over the vehicle compared to that center engine or center core. So I'm not entirely sure, but I think this might be another reason why they normally fly pretty parallel to the horizon. But they also fly with these rockets flat to the horizon for stage separation, so the boosters have the lowest chances of hitting the center core. Okay, so now while we're on the topic of the Falcon Heavy and SpaceX, here's a fun little fact. The Falcon 9 does not perform a roll program to align to its azimuth, and neither does the Electron rocket. Both the Falcon 9 and the Electron just pitch and yaw over however much is necessary and roll for aerodynamic considerations and a few other variables as well. But controlling a rocket in a true 3D space like this is actually a lot harder than it sounds. It took a generation of grad students to actually solve the linear algebra and have access to computers powerful enough on the rockets to do this math in real time for this type of control. So if the Falcon 9 and the Electron rockets don't need to roll, why do they? Well, apparently for fun. Ugh. So I totally got trolled here by Elon. Because on June 12th, 2019, SpaceX launched a trio of satellites for the Canadian Space Agency. Soon after liftoff, the Falcon 9 did a pretty substantial roll. Now again, rockets aren't actually symmetrical, and although the Falcon 9 can navigate along both axes, it's likely that this particular launch had a role like this due to some payload considerations. Customers might have certain constraints, and with this particular launch having an offset payload, perhaps they needed to fly it in a certain way for the payload to best handle the G-forces. The Falcon 9 is also perhaps a little unique in that it for sure wants to be oriented correctly at stage separation, so the first stage has both of its nitrogen thrusters able to help do that flip maneuver. Since the Falcon 9 has only two packs of cold gas thrusters that are 180 degrees apart from each other, this means if the vehicle rotated 90 degrees, only one set of thrusters could help with the flip instead of two. Or here's another fun story. Have you ever seen the very first Falcon 9 launch? It unintentionally rolled almost 45 degrees immediately after takeoff. This was due to the gas generator exhaust that has a slight angle to it. So just like how the Delta IV's RS-68 uses its gas generators to roll, the nine Merlin engines had so much extra torque from the gas generator's exhaust, it took a second for the engine gimbals to cancel the roll out. And one more reason why rockets roll is for the fairing separation. Now, I don't exactly know what considerations go into choosing whether the fairing would split on its y-axis or its z-axis, but it should be noted that this is definitely taken into consideration. For instance, from what I can tell at least, SpaceX tends to ditch their fairings on its y-axis or up and down, while ULA tends to ditch its fairings off to the sides on its z-axis. Why exactly each launch provider chooses to ditch them in this manner? I'm not sure, but it's kind of fun to note. So a few 21st century rockets finally took the roll to align to the azimuth program out, but perhaps my favorite rockets that didn't roll line were Soviet-era rockets. Remember near the beginning when I said it'd be too hard to turn the rocket and or the launch pad to align with its trajectory? Well, that's actually exactly what the Soviet Union came up with for their R7 family of rockets like the Soyuz. That's right, the entire launch pad of the Soyuz actually rotates to align the rocket up with its azimuth. Now some downsides to this is your azimuth might change ever so slightly throughout your launch window. So by aligning the launch pad to your azimuth, you might lose some flexibility in the launch window and flight path. This is something the new Soyuz 2 can do away with now that it has a digital flight computer and it can now align itself on the correct azimuth. Although crewed missions still use a Soyuz FG, which utilizes that rotating table. But lastly, there was still perhaps the most advanced, most ahead of its time rocket, the Soviet Union's N1 rocket, which was meant to, <coughs> never did, 
follow its flight path using both pitch and yaw. It had some roll control thrusters that were undersized for the first three launches and then upgraded for the fourth launch, but they weren't used to align to the azimuth, they were just used for stability. <sighs> I still really wish the N1 had worked out. It's such an awesome rocket. So to summarize, rockets roll for a few reasons. And like all rocket science and engineering, there's actually some good reasons. But as for why? Well, it's generally easier to roll to align the vehicle to its azimuth than it is to move the launch pad. It makes for easier calculations for the guidance computer, rockets roll for aerodynamic and structural considerations, they roll for the astronaut's vantage point and visual references, they roll for fairing deployment orientation, they roll to align auxiliary or control thrusters, and they roll for best line of sight for communications and downlinks. <sighs> so does this help answer that question? It's another one of those fun things where you probably know there's a good reason, but it's just kind of hard to find all those good reasons. Hopefully this helps us appreciate just how many of these little but important decisions engineers and scientists need to come up with every single day. There's always a reason for all the strange little quirks. It's approaching summer here in Australia, so I've got a lot of sunlight to play with. And I noticed something curious, that if you bring two shadows close together, they seem to bend and warp into each other. I recommend you try doing this yourself if you haven't already. The reason it happens is actually quite simple, and it's because objects in the sunlight have fuzzy shadows. This is because the sun is not a point source in the sky. The fuzzy part of the shadow is called the penumbra. When two shadows come close together, the penumbra regions overlap, and the light there gets partially blocked twice, making it look just as dark as the rest of the shadow. Usually one penumbra region on its own is too bright to be detected by your eye as part of the shadow, but when you combine two of them, it is dark enough to be seen. I think this is pretty cool, and I think it's fun to play with shadows. So see for yourself how this effect changes as you move the objects that are being shadowed further away from the ground.
Big Bang. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you at the next meeting in uh, in August. Thank you.